International Media TV. Television that listens to you. Hi, I'm Johnny Burrell. Welcome to the program. Thank you all for uh, coming out. You know, you go on book tours, it's hit or miss. You know, uh, I want to thank my former student, Julian, here. Uh, I've been teaching now for 16 years, and one guarantee of teaching is if you do it long enough, you can find a student in almost any city. <laughs> so uh, you'll never be alone on book tour if you just keep teaching. <laughs> There's the incentive. Uh, yeah, so uh, my name is Mitchell Jackson. Um, you know, it's weird when people uh, say my middle initial, even though I published what it is. Wouldn't that make you feel kind of weird? Like, everybody's saying Mitchell S. Jackson. Uh, I, Mitch Mitchell. Um, I'm from Portland, Oregon. Um, I have spent all of my professional writing career writing about Portland um, and being from uh, a small community in Portland called Northeast Portland. I don't know anyone get up to Portland. Any people? All right. Okay. Yeah, so... Um, I am 43 years old, so I grew up in the uh, 70s, 80s, 90s in, uh, in Portland. And um, when I tell people, but you all have been there, that I'm from Portland, I get a really um, shocked, usually a shocked reaction, like, oh, we didn't know that black people were there. Um, and we really aren't there, because we're always like three, four, five percent of the population, but uh, the area that I grew up in was really a kind of close-knit community. Um, and so I've spent the last 15, 16 years writing about that community. Uh, the first book was a novel called The Residue Years about my immediate family, my mother who struggled with addiction for a number of years and then my kind of foray into selling drugs and eventually um, ended up in prison for a little while. And the second book is this one right here with all these semi-handsome men on the cover. Uh, all of them are members of my family. Uh, all of my brothers, uh, some uncles, uh, grandfather, nephew, cousins. Um, and so I asked, um, as a project, I photographed these men. So these are Polaroid photos that I took of them. Um, and I s took the photographs, or I got the idea for them uh, sometime around the inception of Black Lives Matter and reading some of the uh, news coverage of the uh, shootings and, um, and reading how people were kind of describing the victims as dangerous looking. Uh, and I wanted to figure out a way to speak to that, but I also don't consider myself like the talking head guy on CNN, so I knew that I wasn't gonna do it in the uh, immediate time. So I wanted to figure out a way to kind of uh, still address it. So my solution was to film or photograph the men and to decontextualize them. So if you take a, a close look at these photos, they're all pretty much framed the same way. They're all lit the same way. I had them remove all of their kind of what I thought were any item that might give a clue about their culture, context, age. So, you know, earrings, chains. Um, so I tried to decontextualize them. I all had them wear the same thing, which is a, a black T-shirt. Uh, and then I asked them all the same question. And that question was, what's the toughest thing that you've survived? Uh, and then I took that answer and I transcribed it into a second person narrative. Um, I chose a second person for a few reasons. One reason is because it's like, it works like a first person, so there's the intimacy of the first person, but then it's also an invitation for you to imagine yourself as the protagonist of the story. And I thought, um, having listened to a few of the, the, the stories that they told me that most of the readers that I imagine would have trouble accessing that kind of experience to imagine themselves in that. And I thought, well, the second person is one way to uh, encourage that. Um, that's really, uh, uh, it's not a small part of the book, but the main part of the book are 12 essays that I wrote. Um, the essays um, are all born of some kind of personal experience, either mine or someone that's close to me, addiction, um, incarceration, uh, masculinity. Um, and the book starts 
with an essay written to the first black man to step foot in what became Oregon. Uh, it's a guy named Marcus Lopez, and it was uh, August 16th, 1788 is when he arrived in uh, what became Oregon, and he died that same day. Uh, and the book ends with a letter to my daughter who is uh, headed this way. She's going to Pepperdine next year. Um, so it's a letter with me kind of imagining what I need to give her for the future and starts with imagine what I can do to speak to the past. And so what I'm going to do is read a little bit of the letter to Marcus, and then I'm going to read three survival files. And then if you all want to chat, we can chat. And if not, then I can fill it up with reading some more stuff. Uh, so I'm going to read just a little bit of the, uh, of the letter to Marcus. Dear Marcus, ain't no way you could know this, but you were the first of us to set foot on the land that became the state where I was born, Oregon. And now here we are, strangers, but not estranged, more like kindred, more like forevermore tethered to terra firma by a death date and a birth date. Yours, August 16th, 1788. Mine, August 16th, 1975. Here I am centuries after your death, wanting to share with you what has become of the place where you gasped your last breath and I gloried my first. There's much I don't know about your living and breathing in Cape Verde, so I've envisioned what it was like, have pictured you hanging near the ports, burnished, famished, bleary-eyed, proclaiming to anybody with ears that you'd board a ship bound for the new world and change forevermore your fortune. Then Captain Robert Gray and his crew docked their sloop for a little R&R &R and refitting. The way I picture it, Gray trekked inland and high sided about how historic his voyage would be, about how he'd captain his Lady Washington around Cape Horn and through the Drake Passage to America's west coast to trade trinkets for furs and sell on to China. About how he was looking to add a new member to his small crew. As I imagined it, his notice sounded to you like the ocean looked in your dreams. So you fat mouthed to Gray and crew how much you knew about seafaring how quick you could learn what you didn't know. Big up how good you were with your hands, how able a swimmer you were, the super through in your thin arms and legs, declared if there was a challenge to be met, you'd meet it. So help you God. Whatever your pitch, sure enough, you were aboard the ship and sailing around the horn for this new world. What were those days like? Did you expect to watch the sunset over the horizon, to witness a full moon in a sky sprint with stars, to hear the music of the sails catching the wind, but instead sorrowed over gales bashing the yards, a tempest tossing the ship on her broadside, gray yelling, all hands on deck. Your shipmate, Haswell, did y'all call him Robbie? Logged in his journal details of your first day in this place we share, your last day on earth. He wrote that the ship landed at Tillamook Bay and he and some of the crew had a meal with the natives while the rest of you were out cutting grass for the livestock. The two took a break, stabbed your cutlass in the sand, and when you returned, and when you turned your back, one of the natives snatched it and broke out. I imagine you dread it. Were it me, I would have been spooked something serious. The prospect of Gray learning you lost your tool, of him losing faith in you, and that you wanted to avoid at grave cost the prospect of the crew teasing you something terrible about being greened. And or the haters among them dubbing you a dim-witted black boy for the rest of the voyage. Or maybe... It was fear that the cost of the tool would be subtracted from whatever pay Gray had offered if he pledged any recompense at all. As Haswell told it, there wasn't much time between you peeping your cutlass missing and catching the culprit. Per his pen, 
While he and some of the other crew raced to your aid, the natives instantly drenched their knives and spears with savage fury in you until you released the thief, staggered, and fell dead. Haswell admitted he and the others punk shit, perhaps, broke for the ship to avoid the same happening to them. So uh, that's the story of the uh, first guy, African descent, to reach Oregon. Um, I am going to now read uh, some of these survival files. Let's see, where do we start? Uh, there. Uh, I, 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 I don't think I mentioned this, that um, I never mentioned which story belongs to which person. Uh, I wanted to um, give the men in my family a, a bit of anonymity, but I also wanted to persuade the reader to um, uh, try to figure out which story belonged to which person, and furthermore, to ask themselves what did they see in any particular photograph that uh, informed their decision making. So it was a way for me to persuade people to kind of investigate their implicit biases. Um, 234, here we go. All right. Yeah, okay. These were the hip, slick, cool years that you sold the cocaine and your older brother the heroine, and both of you lived in his curious colored house out in the suburbs. You could claim this was the consequence of somebody burgling TVs and guns out of that house. Might argue it began days after the heist when you drop by the pad of a partner who buys your Coke and see your Trinitron TV in it. You ask him, where he copped the TV and he discloses he bought it from a white boy who you also sell dope. Your friend admits the white boy furthermore sold him a gun which, as it turns out, was also stolen from your house. Well, ain't this a bitch, you say. You file a neighborhood APB on the white boy and obtain an address out in Southeast. You recruit your ace boon coon and a younger brother, hop in your ride armed with pistols and a shotgun, and will out to southeast with half your hardening heart set on killing him. Soon, your hodgepodge crew of hitmen reach the address and, strapped, march onto the front porch. The house is lit, and you can see people loafing inside and see what looks like a family, not a one of whom resembles the white boy. It don't take long to glean that you've been fed a bunk address for your slapdash crew to scramble stealth off the porch and into your ride for you to wheel back into Northeast woofing the whole way about what you'll do if when you find this Steven ass white boy. You cruise by the jumping night spot, wouldn't you know it, spy the white boy's car with him in it. You creep on the white boy, threaten him out of his car, glare with your pistol drawn. You'll be thankful, years later, for the whisper in your spirit that won't let you kill him. But in the moment, you watch him reach for, you watch the white boy jerk as if to grab a gun and your ace boom coon ram him through a front window of the nearest building. While the two of them tussle, you wonder, what next? What next? No such ambivalence in your brother, though, who takes one long step closer and busts several shots through the window. By luck or grace or sinner's faith, the shots miss the white boy, but hit him. Your shots miss the ace boon coon, but hit the white boy in the arm. Or was it the leg? You'll be mighty, mighty thankful years later that the white boy didn't die and that nobody involved the police. Because you believe with all your softened heart that killing a white boy would have been the end of your freedom, which is to say the end of any life you can stand. Or could it have been when you were living on the fumes of hip slick cool 
the time in the throes of your addiction. You slept into a dope house with umpteen days worth of dirty clothes stuffed in a duffel bag and spent days. Or was it an eon puffing rocks with one of your old ace boons and reminiscing on the years when you wanted nothing more than to pull a Cadillac with automatic shutoff lights off the showroom floor. Back when there was little more important than laying claim to woman galore. Back when you dreamed of traveling to big places, owning a big house on the hill. You shamble into the bathroom to piss and find a toilet bowl chocked with shit and toilet paper. You pinch your next breath, hold it, hold it. Power piss. You quick wash your hands and ain't this a bitch see shit smeared all over the towel when you reach to dry them. Fast as a beam up, you feel every bit of what you become. You slump out of the bathroom into the room where your old Ace Boone sits fondling his pipe. That's it for me, man, you say. I ain't using no more. You grab your duffel and lumber out of the door. Don't stop till you reach your sister's house, the same sister who's miracle two years clean. She answers, peers at you, steps aside. Sis, I don't want to do this no more, you say. I know you know how to do it. What should I do? Your sister throws up a hand, whisks into another room, returns carrying towels. Here, she says, the first thing you need to do is take a bath. Um, okay. So I was trying to do these by errors. I'm picking different errors. This, that was uh, 1960, late 60s, early 70s. Uh, and, and one of the things that I tried to do with Survival Files was to approximate the voice of the different people who were telling me the story. So there's something, there's a nod to how this particular person speaks in every one of these. So for this one, it's hip slick cool, right? So you, if you can imagine the error in which someone would say hip slick cool. Um, I'm gonna pick a different error. Maybe I'll read it, you can tell me the error. You're out one night at the weekend hot spot of too many straight shots to count and therefore the kind of fader you swear manifold you're funny when you hear a dude you don't know say blood to cap a sentence. Damn, I didn't know niggas are still gangbanging you say and search the nearest faces for mirth. But don't nobody smile nor laugh and in fact dude smacks you upside your dome as if your joke was his cue. In an instant, the two of you take to scrapping inside the club while neighborhood dudes whose account could damage your rep bear witness and you best him before being wrenched apart and bounced outside. He paces one way, you pace the other, and in the distance between you lies the tacit truth that the animosity is in no way squashed. The next day, your friend is hosting your brother's moving to New York barbecue fish fry and you show up hours prior, dump a shoebox carrying your Uzi and nine millimeter on the living room table and shout to the group of gathered men and God. I heard niggas was looking for me. Well, let them know. I ain't hard to find. Somebody gonna die. In your mid thirties, you'll bust one shot near, but just near your father, not to shoot him, no, near your father, inside your crib, not to kill him, but to discourage him from discouraging you against prosecuting what might be your last ballistic beef. But on this day, you're in your late 20s, which in this case is plenty old enough to die. You stomp out of the house and slam yourself into a car driven by your ride to beyond good sense girlfriend. Your brother calls and cautions you against doing something you'll regret and furthermore against returning to the barbecue fish fry. Hours after his call, you flout your diss 
invitation, which is to say you show up and stalk the yard with a waist tuck, nine millimeter bulging under your t-shirt and a scowl that ain't got no place near nothing festive. You see a dude who witnessed your scuffle the night before, a dude who's a friend of your new foe, and you flash your nine and threaten him into the basement. You lay your pistol in plain view and seethe. Nigga, we can scrap right here, right now, you say. Nah, bro. I don't want no problems, he says. And warns your newest arches foe heard word of your whereabouts and is on his way to the barbecue fish fry for action. By now, almost everyone wants you to leave, including the father of the friend who's hosting, and it's the father's wish you decide to heed. Oh, the timing. You stomp out of the yard, peer down the street, and in the distance, see your new arch foe among a circle of dudes. You pull your pistol from your waist, and men, women, and God's only begotten son be damned. March into the middle of the street. Once, you told a grade school teacher of your plan to become a hitman. And though you haven't considered that career choice in ages, today could be the day that delivers you to the threshold of that young hope. Before you shoot yourself into that fate, a girl you know from high school darts between you and your new foe. She calls your name, pleads, please don't, please. She announces your fast foe is her brother, appeals once more against gunplay, and you pause, seeing an escape out of what a breath before felt foreordained. Oh, that's your brother, you say? And lower your pistol. The next week, you pull into the parking lot of the grocery store with your daughter in the passenger seat and out of some place unseen, your foe pulls up beside you. Neither hand touches the wheel and you bet blood on why they aren't in view and what one holds. Decisions, of which the most full would be to reach for what's under your seat. Your daughter is a fifth grader, which is to say, in this instance, plenty old enough to die. You curl over her embrace, and when you don't hear a pistol bark, you raise your head and shake it. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Look your foe eye to assassin black eye and mouth. Man, I don't want no problems. It's squashed. It's squashed. He idles for what could be the rest of your and your firstborn's life. Oh, I should say, I want to say this, because I haven't actually said this uh, in any reading thus far. Is, um, oh, no, that's the long one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I got end notes in this book, and uh, I'm going to share a sequel with, with y'all. So I had, I actually fought for these end notes. Uh, they were once footnotes, and I don't know how you all feel about reading footnotes. But uh, I, I'm in a, I've been in a workshop for eight years or something, and uh, I have a workshop member who is very adamant about against footnotes. And so we fought, fought, fought. I'm like, no, nah, I'm keeping them. He's like, no, nah, man, nobody wants to read that. And I like, I don't, I don't care what they want. I'm putting them in. So, uh, but then when I handed the book in to my editor, she was like, oh, Mitch, like nobody wants to read footnotes. <laughs> I was like, nah, I spent all this time doing this research. I'm putting them in. So then we compromised. Um, and a part of the reason why we compromised is because, oh, excuse me. Uh, one of the end notes is 30 pages long. Yeah. So it was actually a part of an essay in this book called Apples, which, and I was trying to track the history of whiteness. So it was... Well, at the time, it was the most researched thing that I've ever written. 
Um, I, I beat that with another essay in this, but uh, it took a very long time, months and months and months of research. And I was really uh, trying to track, because I, I read this James Baldwin essay where he says, like, no one was white before they got here. And just that statement made me think, well, is that true? Like, did, did whiteness begin in America? And if so, like, what were the seeds of it? Anyway, so I got a long, long footnote. And most people, you might not notice it because it's, like, hidden. And the end notes are, like, hidden in the back. It's almost like my publisher was, like, trying to hide them from the reader. So if you actually read this, like, push past to the end. And there's, like, a really long footnote. <laughs> you know? It's a good footnote, though. It's a good footnote. You know, I spent a lot of time on that footnote. Okay, so here's the last uh, survival file that I read. You ask your mom for movie ticket money and maybe even popcorn, for a couple of bucks to hang with your buds, for a check to cover registration or the sports fee or the student ID fee, for cash to purchase the C package of the school pictures, and all year she snaps, we don't have it. Then one day after school, you bop home and see a white sheet taped to your front door, the words eviction notice in bold face. You snatch the sheet off the door, gape at the small print teeter inside the apartment and wait, thinking, why didn't she tell me how bad it was? Thinking, why didn't she call my dad or grandpa for help? Thinking, where will we go? Your mom slips in from work and you hand her the notice, eviction? What? No. She tramps into her bedroom and calls somebody and you can hear her pleading with whomever it is. She stomps out of the room, eyes smudged black, and confirms you'll have to move. You have a few weeks. And each day she doesn't find an apartment is another day for you to anguish over if you'll end up homeless. Close to the deadline, she reports she found a cheaper apartment in, of all places, a complex across the street from the one you must leave. Your mom can't afford a moving truck, much less movers, so she and you alone load TVs, tables, couches, shelves, dressers, clothes, the megatons of junk she hoards, etc. in her raggedy Range Rover, jaunt it to the new complex and unload it all. With each trip, you feel your arms and legs losing strength. Begin to feel aches in your back, fire in your palms, breath gusting out of you, which you're determined to finish because you must because it's your destiny to discover not just the limits of what you can heft, but how much weight you can bear. Um, so that's what I plan to read. I mean, I can read more if y'all want to rap, uh, but if you all want to have a conversation, I mean, I feel like I'm with my cousins in my grandma's basement. So uh, if y'all, want to chat, I'm open to questions. If not, there's like 336 pages I can read from. <laughs> but, um, so I'm, I'm training to become a clinical psychologist in my first year right now. Okay. And the question that's always on my mind in any context is what healing looks like. Mm -hmm. And with these stories of survival and the research that you've done, I'm curious if that's shaped your understanding of healing, especially as it intersects with race poverty, yeah. society in general? Hmm. Uh, you know, I, it's, uh, I guess it's interesting because I didn't necessarily think about, uh, damn, this is getting away from me. Uh, I didn't really think that much about healing. And I should have been thinking about healing. But I think maybe I just didn't call it that because I did think that sharing these stories might be a salve to someone else. Um, but having been a storyteller now for going on two decades, I should have also known that sharing a story is a salve for me and for the person, whoever is sharing the story. So I do think, you know, it's something to like bottle in, 
keeping things bottled up and, and, and what that does to the body. And so just for them to be able to share a story with me had, I hope, offered them some kind of relief. Um, and I think it's especially important for the men, at least the, the men in this book and the men in my community, because it's not something that we would share otherwise, right? Like we tell, um, we'll tell each other war stories, but we won't tell each other what it feels like to be wounded. Um, I was just home yesterday uh, for a couple of days. And um, well, first of all, I should, this, this, this story starts that I was in Wisconsin three days ago, I think. What's today? It's Tuesday? Okay, so I think maybe Saturday or Friday, I was in Wisconsin and I was going into the library. And actually, if y'all go to Wisconsin, I don't know why y'all would go to Wisconsin, but if you go to Wisconsin, uh, they got like the best library, the most beautiful library that I've ever seen. Um, yeah, they remodeled it. So, okay, the most beautiful new looking library that I've ever seen, I should say. And, uh, but when I was walking in, there were like a group of uh, young black men on the side. And they, two of them were kind of standing face to face. And one of them was like, oh, no, nah, blood. And I was like, they got bloods in Wisconsin? And so I just I walked in, and then I actually said that to them. I was like, where did y'all get bloods from? Like, I thought that was like a West Coast. I mean, I, I knew, I know how it happens. So then I came home. And I was telling this same story to like some of my old homeboys. I'm like, man, you'll never guess what happened when I was in Wisconsin. I heard two dudes talking about gang banging. And they was like, man, don't you remember? My partner was going out there selling dope and gang banging in the 90s. I was like, oh yeah, I, I actually forgot about that. And then, this is actually a really long story. So anyway, one of my partners, he not my partner, a guy that I know from my era, not my partner, had uh, got killed in Wisconsin. And uh, so then uh, a, a guy that I know was telling me the story that he, this is what I'm talking about, we're telling each other a war story, we won't talk about the healing. He said he was out one night, and uh, I can tell the story now because everybody's dead. He was out one night, and he was, he was with a guy who wanted to leave a spot because he didn't feel comfortable. So he was like, all right, let me go get my car and then I'm gonna pick you up in the front. And he says when he walks outside, uh, he walks past a guy that he knows and the guy's like standing like in the shadow, like, you know, strapped. Like, and he's like, hey man, he's like, I see you. Like, what are you doing? And he's like, oh man, I'm about to lay this dude out. And he was like, uh, okay, well, like, I'm, I'm going to go to my car. Like, I ain't seen nothing, right? You don't want to be the person that sees it, right? So he says he goes and gets in his car, and then he's driving back around to pick up the friend who he said he would pick up from the front. And when he gets on the side, his, his friend notices that the guy that was standing like this in the shadows is now ducking behind his car. So he says his friend gets in the car. He's like, hey, man, what's this dude doing? He's like, man, I, I don't know what he's doing. Like, but we leaving. So when he pulls off, the dude comes up from the car and lets off and kills the dude in the club. Oh, this is the same dude that then went to Wisconsin and also got killed, right? So these are the kind of stories we talk about, but we don't talk about what it's like to see the guy get hit and fall, right? Like that's, and it's not, it's not a story we could, we could share. I mean, now I can share it because everybody dead, but like, it's just not something that we would be able to share as men who grew up in the same community. And the crazy thing is we all know each other, you know, like that's the crazy thing in Portland is like, we're such a small community that like when these things happen, it's like you did something to somebody's cousin. You might've done something to your second cousin, you know, like that's how the community is. But I, I do think that, um, well, not that particular story, but like sharing these stories with each other and then talking about like what it feels like to have this thing happen, what it feels like to witness this thing, because he will tell me that, but I, I bet you he would not share with me like a really tough wound that he's feeling and what that like emotionally does to him. That was a really long answer, but um, go visit the Wisconsin Library. Uh, I'm curious how you decided to focus on the men in, yeah. in your family and not, and not perhaps women. Yeah, well, I think that kind of came out of the, what I was reading because, I mean, I know there were also 
um, female victims. But I think by and large, they were painting the men as dangerous by the way that they looked. And so I was really addressing that and trying to deconstruct that. But I have since won a fellowship from PEN America. I don't know if y'all are familiar with PEN America. Um, writers, advocates all over the world. Um, so I won a fellowship. And as part of that fellowship, I'm actually doing the same thing with women who were formerly incarcerated and women who work in criminal justice. So I, I've already shot a few of these. So I, um, there are women who, like, I did the Multnomah County. Uh, she runs a uh, probation and parole for Multnomah County, which is a county that I come from. And then I'm also doing women who are formerly incarcerated. Same thing, like, well, actually, they wouldn't, like, take off their earrings and not wear makeup. And so I didn't get to decontextualize them in the same way that I did the men. But that's what I want to do is not is to share their stories and then not tell you which story belongs to which person. Um, so I, real, I recognize that that is also something that I needed to address. Yeah. Yes. You had said that you um, kept these stories anonymous. Were they anonymous to the other men in your family? Have people learned things that they didn't know? Yeah. And how did that go? So they've been asking, you know, so the only person that knows all of the stories is me. Uh, and, you know, if, if these, you know, so there's, there's, there's brothers here. So, like, obviously you might have heard about the story that someone told me. But, like, as I am imagined it, like, no one, like, I wanted to be really, really, um, I wanted to have a fidelity to that, to what I, I told them that I would do. Uh, and, and so even yesterday while I was home, I had a person contact me because they were mad about a story in that, that was told that they, they thought that they were a subject in it. And I, I said, well, I mean, I can't even tell you if that's, if that's true. But if it is true, like, you shouldn't necessarily be mad because that's that person's story. It's like, oh, it's not true. That's not how it happened. Well, it doesn't really matter how you say it happened because it's their story. Um, and so, yes, I've caught, I've caught a little bit of flack. But the other thing is I just came from home, and I didn't give anyone a book until yesterday. So I imagine that next week or however quick they read, you know, it's, it's go, I, and I'm going back to Portland in, on May 27th, I mean uh, March 27th, so I think by the time I get back, I'll have more to deal with in that manner. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? Have you uh, or know of anybody who has done a book or uh, about black men crying? Hmm. No. Uh, yeah, I, w I would love to see someone do that. Uh, I would love to you see You should the, do it. I, well, see, that's what I was saying. I'm like, I, who's going to be the subjects? Uh, I think that that's, again, it's like the, we don't share our wounds. We only share, like, the war stories, I think. Uh, well, I think that's not true. I think we do share our wounds as a kind of currency. You know, like, I got a cousin that's been shot, like, four or five times and like he'll tip man I've been shot four or five times but he says it not like like let me tell you what being shot multiple times feels like what that does to your psyche it's like I have been shot this many times and I'm alive so I'm like almost a superhuman but crying man I mean I think I think you have to get to a really good place in your life where you can be that vulnerable at least with another man um, and that's it's sad because um, I think we're causing ourselves a lot of you know psychological trauma, but then also like physical trauma, right? Like I just read uh, Lydia Yuknovich is a writer from Portland who um, I really admire, and she was she just made a long, not, it wasn't a rant, but she was speaking about how she was a cry, she used to cry a lot when she was young, and people would like penalize her for it or to speak bad about her, and she was like, well, actually, crying is a release for us and we should be crying. And then she said something about like how it reminds you that our bodies are so much water. Um, but I don't think that, I don't, I don't know, if, there's not a man who I grew up with who has that same kind of uh, ideology about crying and about vulnerability. <laughs> well,
Well, I could say that it just seems to me uh -huh. that when there's a lot of pain, yeah, it it's you you have to, you can't it would destroy you if you yeah. started trying to deal with all the feelings around it yeah you have to kind of put it in block it in a room inside of you somewhere mm -hmm. which causes problems i mean it's good to release things yeah but there's a point when you're just dealing with so much around you and mm -hmm. your whole community is dealing with that yeah. that it just seems like it it's very hard i mean and one, well, one thing I can say, I study white male privilege a lot. The mm. one thing I know very well is a white man can have a temper tantrum in public mm. and act like a complete idiot. Mm. And then everybody's there to say, oh, well, what can we do to help you? Mm -hmm. If a woman does that or a black man does that, forget it. I mean, um, you know, it's, it's not tolerated. That, mm. That's something that white men get to do. And so is it almost seems like black men are not even allowed to feel. The whole thing about Obama couldn't get angry. Yeah. So so we've we've got to allow black men to express their feelings. Okay. Uh, it, yesterday, um, I, I don't know enough about the the kind of racial uh, history of this area. So I'll speak to Portland, um, which was founded with an exclusion law in its constitution, the only state admitted into the union with an exclusion law in its constitution. And then, you know, we have these years later. And it also has a, uh, a history of white supremacy. Uh, and so, uh, you know, these years later, it's no wonder why we, it's like 5% or 75% white. I think if, if I, I think that our, the, the kind of national reputation of Oregon and of Portland is as a place of liberals and progressives. What do you all think? Yeah, would you say that? Okay. But I keep reading about white supremacist rallies. I keep reading about like hate crimes in Portland. And so, yes, really, all yesterday I was asking myself, how can this place be a bastion for both the white supremacists and the liberals and progressive? Like how can all of those people think this is the place we should live? Um, and the, the, the answer that I came up with was whiteness trumps everything. You know, like as long as we can have a monolith, it doesn't really matter if we have these ideological problems because we're really all in this shit together. Um, and maybe I'll pose that to anyone that wants to speak to that. As a, yeah. What was the exclusion law that you was getting ready to talk about that you never did? Not the, yeah, not that, that blacks could start not... Over, please, so we can oh, yeah, sorry. Start over. What is the exclusion law that you was getting ready to elaborate on but yeah. you never did go into any kind of detail? Okay, well, I, I didn't want to elaborate on it that much, but uh, it's, it's just that blacks were not admitted into the state. That they, uh, if they were there, they had a certain amount of time before they had to leave, and you could not be legally in the state if you were a black person when Oregon was founded. So they wanted a monolith of whiteness in the territory. So this is a little bit different from what you were saying, uh -huh. but I recently, last night I watched this movie about PTSD mm -hmm. called uh, Waltz with Bashir. Mm -hmm. and Wait, what's the title? Waltz with Bashir. Okay. It's really good. And it talks about how these soldiers kind of blacked out the memories. So mm -hmm. even when they wanted to process them and talk about them, mm -hmm. they just genuinely didn't remember them. Yeah. Um, and I wonder kind of like what level of that do you think happens in your community? Yeah. Well, I was listening to uh, a podcast today, the New York Times, New York Times book review podcast is long to say. And uh, I can't remember the, the, the author's name, which I should remember this author's name. He wrote a book about a, a, a summer in Chicago. Has anyone heard about this new book? No? Okay. Well, I'll Google it or something. Uh, but he said something about people in Chicago, which everyone kind of knows about the the violence in Chicago, but he said that that the that they had the same responses that soldiers had right to PTSD. I also write in 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 my book that uh, so do sex workers. So sex workers exhibit the same kind of symptoms of PTSD as soldiers as well. But the thing that he said that really interested me is he said that 
But it's not PTSD because they're never over it, right? Because it, it's, they're always in it, right? So you have to kind of maintain that vigilance. You're always being re-traumatized. So, you know, if you go to war and you come back home, you can get post that war trauma and then you have to deal with being in the world. But if you grow up in these neighborhoods and the culture of it doesn't change and the violence doesn't change, then you are, there's no pass to it, right? It's just, what is it? Stress disorder, right? Or traumatic stress disorder ongoing, not post. Um, so I think that is kind of, what happens in the communities, right? And then, you know, you get all these kind of coping mechanisms, right? You think you're bulletproof or you play like you're bulletproof. You uh, figure a way to kind of stash your feelings where, uh, you know, you're not vulnerable. You treat vulnerability as if it's a weakness, you know? You duck a responsibility if you can because you're not, you don't have the means to take care of them. I mean, a lot of different things. I'm not saying nothing new to y'all, but. Um, I do think that was interesting that he was saying there was no such thing as post-traumatic stress disorder, that they were all c constantly in it. Have you ever heard of Dr. Nadine Burke? No, I haven't. Okay. She's a local doctor who mm -hmm. works with children in public housing mm -hmm. and has pretty much described it as starts very early, yeah. PTSD mm -hmm. never is addressed. Yeah. And she just became our head doctor in California, so I'm hoping she will do something. Okay. She's very impressive young lady. Okay. I'll have to look her up. Yeah, well, uh, I, I don't remember the name of the study, but uh, the, the study... Um, well, what came out of the study is the um, is the claim that you can tell by fourth grade whether or not someone's going to go to prison. Yeah. And, we, uh, and yeah, a part of that is their, uh, or the main marker is their reading level. But I think, I mean, to, to think that a person's fate or destiny is already sealed by fourth grade, that seems unfair. Um, and I wonder, you know, I mean, then we have to take kind of, I guess, take a look at the, s the school systems and the other kind of uh, cultural, social, political problems that would allow that to be. Um, and even like, if you were doing poor in fourth grade, like why, <laughs> how could uh, anything that you do in fourth grade mark you for life? You know, like that is, is something is wrong with that. But I mean, it seems like the same thing where like if you experience this trauma in the home at a, such a young age, you are going to be marked forever as a person who has these kind of symptoms. Uh, anyone else? What, what was the turning point for you with regard to this uh, young black man and simply turning your life around? Uh, turning point. Yeah, I, I have definitely answered this question before, and every time I answer it, it sounds a little different to me because I'm not sure what it was. I mean, the easy thing is just to say, like, I went to prison, but that's not really a turning point because I don't really think that my thinking changed that much. Um, I have a friend, Boz Dresinger, Dr. Boz Dresinger, who has a program called uh, the prison to college pipeline. So you know they got the other one, right? The college, uh, the school to prison pipeline. So she has the prison to college pipeline. She's been doing these all over the world. It started with John Jay College in New York and she just, I just saw her post today that she's opening one in South Africa. Um, but we were on a panel uh, a couple of years ago and she was talking about um, how people love to frame prison as the possibility of rehabilitation. She said, but that is a misnomer because most of the men who end up in prison were never habilitated to begin with. And so you can't rehabilitate someone who was never habilitated. Um, and so I think about that in terms of myself, that like I was never habilitated, right? So like I was raised in a culture of pathology, of you know, um, behaviors that were criminalized, a uh, certain kind of treatment of women. Um, so I didn't, and I, that like I was born into this, I was nurtured with this, um, and I really held those all through prison. Um, well, I do, will say though, like once I got to prison, 
And when I left, I can remember looking back. It was a sunny day. It was July 8th, 1998, and going, they ain't going to see me again. Like, I mean, they have seen me because I go back and talk to the fellows, but, like, I have not been uh, incarcerated. And I guess interesting is that that was my first arrest, my only arrest. <laughs> so my first arrest and my only arrest was the one that sends me to prison, and I have never been back since, though I have all of the kind of baggage that comes along with being a formerly incarcerated person. Um, so uh, maybe the turning point came, so if I f finished my sentence in 1998, in 2008, 2009, I met a, a guy named Gordon Lish. Uh, this is after two graduate, well, I finished my undergrad and went to two graduate writing programs. And uh, he instilled in me the belief that I could be a great writer. And that informed, has informed the rest of my decision making. Um, to have something, not just to be like, oh, you can do this as a career, but like you might even have the possibility of being great. And um, I think to have that as a goal um, has given me a kind of purpose that I just, I was just kind of floating before that. Like, oh, maybe I'm, I'm pretty good at basketball, but I'm not that good. You know, like I can do this thing okay, but not that good. And it never felt very purposeful. So uh, 2008, which I can't remember how old I was, but I know I was in my 30s before I felt like, okay, um, something might happen for you. Okay, I know I already asked a question, <laughs> but... Um, um, at my school, there is a white privilege accountability group, and it's comprised uh. only of white people. Mm -hmm. um, I'm an Indian American female, and mm. so I don't go to the meetings, but I'm friends with a lot of people who are in them. Okay. And one girl was telling me in our carpool home, like, man, there's a lot of stuff going down in the WPAG group, <laughs> WPAG, white privilege accountability group, okay. um, because <laughs> they are having trouble deciding on an agenda, and they're having trouble uh. figuring out what to do to mm. be held accountable. And she was like, do you have any ideas? It's a person of color. And I was like, you know, let me think about this and get back to you. But I feel like you're someone who's probably thought about this a little bit more. So if you have oh. uh, advice for a dedicated, eager group of white people in Berkeley, I would love to pass along the info. Uh, oh, man. I, so, I mean, I don't think I can say anything that isn't already being done. Uh, but I'll tell you what I think are things that are being done. And then I'll like give you my critique of it. Uh, so one of the things I've, I've been thinking about is like uh, this idea of noblesse oblige, right? That like the kind of rich aristocrats, in this case white people, kind of are indebted to the people below them to like give them some kind of charity. So I think one thing we should do is like ask where is it coming from? Is it coming from like yes, I have this white privilege, I'm better, and now I'm going to go be a humanitarian for two weeks. I'm going to donate some money from my, you know, this bonus I just got, and, <laughs> you know, give it to the local whatever. Um, so I think, like, to figure out kind of where that comes from, though, that's not really a tangible thing. But then I, the first thing I thought of was, like, well, they should make some, they should, like, create a scholarship, Right? which I think is something very tangible. Like if you give a person a good education, like you really kind of setting them up. But I have been thinking a lot about this, this idea of um, elite institutions, which include like private, uh, you know, elementary schools, private high schools, obviously the Ivy Leagues, right? And so they like, this culture of elitism is really damaging, it's like, it's like another arm of white supremacy, right? Because they're going to allow a certain number of people who are not part of that group to get in, but they've been doing that. So it's like, they're not really interested in changing the status quo. Um, so when I say scholarship, like, what are we gonna give a scholarship to? We're gonna give a scholarship to someone to get into an elite institution so they can get swept up in the same kind of tide that all the other elites get swept up in. And y'all know y'all been probably watching this, um, this scandal, right? Well, this is why I know about the scandal. Like, your kid wasn't good enough to get into San Diego State? <laughs> like, you really was doing some, like, if you got enough money to spend $500,000 to, 
to get a school, get a kid in a school. Like, you should have done something before that because San Diego State ain't popping. You know, like, it's okay, but, like, that's not Stanford. <laughs> that's not Yale. You know, like, can you believe that? You got to pay $20,000 to get your kid into school X? <laughs> that was crazy to me. Okay, that was an aside. I'm sorry. That was, I shouldn't have said that. No knock on any institute. Like, I went to community college, two of them. So, like, I can't speak, but I've also spent enough time in around Ivy's, and I've been at NYU for 15 years. Um, so I don't know, because, you know, like, I, I, maybe the, I guess the best thing is to make the schools that are underserved, to serve the schools that are underserved. So if they really want to do some, give some money to a school that needs a budget for some supplies at school or for some books. Or if they have an expertise, oh, that's what it is. Um, I have a friend, Dee Watkins, uh, who has a book coming out next month called We Speak for Ourselves. He also has two other nonfiction books. I can't remember the titles of them off the top of my head, but get the new one. Uh, but what he says in there is he says, this is, this is a question that a lot of people of privilege give you, like, I want to help. What can I do? And he, his answer was Skillshare. So he said, if you are a photographer, go to the neighborhood where the kids don't have cameras or don't know about this and teach someone how to shoot. If you are a pipe fitter, take someone on the job with you and show them how to, so I think that that's maybe one thing that they can do, like figure out what it is that they are, what's their expertise, and then go share that expertise with someone who does not have it. Oh, there, I'm gonna tell him that I borrowed his comment. <laughs> uh, anyone else, anyone else? Yes. Um, there's a mention in the book about a film. Mm -hmm. Can you say more about that? Yeah. Uh, so with The Residue Years, which was my novel, um, it was semi-autobiographical. And I thought I was trying to get ahead of the questions of how much of this is true, how much of it isn't true. And so I made a documentary that shared the truth about you know, my mother, her addiction, our relationship. Uh, and to be honest with you, I was not satisfied with it. It was my first feature length film. I did most of it out of pocket for probably four years I was working on it. And then I met some rich people who uh, gave me some money to finish it. And it just never, you know, I would watch it and I would go, ooh, I wish I would have did this, or I wish I knew to do this. Um, so it was a big learning curve, and then obviously as a documentary, like I don't have the skill set to make it myself. So then it's also translating your vision to other people uh, with that skill set. Um, so, but I, but it, but it also birthed in me the, uh, I guess, the goal of creating some kind of film project with all of my books. So when I got to survival math, I was like, well, I don't want to do a documentary. I want to do a film. So uh, I shot a short film, or made a short film, of from some of the, most of the men on the cover are in the film. And what I did is try to uh, animate their stories like, by, by symbolism. Um, so the film is 12 minutes. Um, I screened it at uh, the Brooklyn Library. I had a reading. Uh, last week sometime, and uh, again, I said, oh, I wish I would have did this and that. The, the, the great thing about this is I can. <laughs> so no one else will see this thing until, because my thing is I spend so much time on my work, right? Like there are sentences, there's no sentence in survival math that was not revised several, not a sentence that was not revised several times. Um, and some of them, like, you wouldn't imagine how many times I've revised them. Um, and so, and, but I also have that control, right? I don't have to, like, ask anyone to go in and use a program that I don't know how to use to fix it. And so I want to have this, I want what I make in a film to match what I think I can do on a page. And if it, if it doesn't do that, then I, I almost don't even want to share it 
with with anyone because I like I, I hold myself to a certain standard with with this art that needs to go across any kind of genre that I work in, uh, which is frustrating because again, I can make it over here, but I I can only ask and suggest over in this area. Uh, but yeah, there is a film. It's done, kind of. No one can see it yet. It's, I mean, I'll, you know, I'll get to it. I'll get to it, you know, another six months or so, something like that. Uh, anyone else? Anyone else? Yes. So I've been, like, uh, thinking this question over for a while now, so it might come out very uh, uh -huh. obfuscated. But um, so in this book, you're, pre you're presenting, like, a shade of blackness, mm -hmm. which, so like right now there's like a big, I, I'd say in popular culture, it's always, black people have always, always been writing, but in popular culture, there's like this big emphasis on reading black literature now. Yeah. And all these are showing different shades of blackness, which mm -hmm. the, the culture has its own preconceived notion of what blackness is. Yeah. But like we know that <laughs> it's literally, it's, it's as convoluted as just being human, you know? Um, right. And so I was just going to say, like, do you have any authors or writers or any artists in general right now who are sort of redefining that textuality of blackness that sort of inspire you or you think that are very important at the moment? Um, well, yes. <laughs> yes, I do. Um, I think, uh, so one of the things, I'll start with myself. So I, I know that having done probably 30 interviews in the last week, I see what people want to hear from me, right? They want to hear like, they're like, oh, tell us about that time you almost got shot. Uh, uh, let me know about, did your mom really try to buy crack from you? Uh, and, and I'm always trying to take that question and say like, let's talk about the conditions that made it possible for crack to enter my community. But that's a di different, different conversation than like you got eight minutes on NPR, right? Um, so I, I recognize that and I think it's up to writers of color, queer, to, to, to um, assert themselves when they're being marginalized or reduced. Um, so I recognize that and, and, and it's a part of the reason why I, I chose the essay form is because the essay forces the reader to reckon with the writer's mind, right? So I could have just wrote a memoir about like, you know, start uh, coming out of prison and becoming a professor. And people would have bought that and be like, oh my God, like it's possible for these things to happen. Like it can't be that bad, but I didn't want to be reduced to that, right? So in every one of these essays, which I, I guess I should have mentioned, there is at heart an idea. If you pick up this book, and a lot of people are calling this a memoir, it is not a memoir. It is an essay collection. Every chapter is a discrete idea. Not necessarily discrete as if it doesn't connect in any way to the other essays, but like it was not meant to be read as a linear story. It was not meant to be read as a nonlinear story. It was meant that here is an idea and here, is, uh, here are some experiences which help illuminate this idea. Um, so that's just if you absolutely decide to read the book, like I think that's very helpful because people that are going to this for memoir are going, oh, where's, like, where's the story arc and like, where does this person come back in? Or some people are confusing the survival files with my story. Like, no, my mom didn't die of an overdose. No, I did not go to prison during Jim Crow. You know, like, so I think um, we have to be careful with that. Uh, writers, I think, are, there's, I mean, so many writers, but I'll just mention a few. Like, I think Darnell Moore, um, No Ashes in the Fire, uh, he's a black gay man, and uh, he's also went to seminary school, so he has this kind of theological underpinning to his writing. And I think he is doing some, he's also got a really good haircut too. He's stayed with a good haircut. That's beside the point. Um, I think he's doing some really good work. Um, I mean, you know, obviously, uh, you know, I'm gonna mention Coates. Well, I think he does a really good job of like looking at us from up here, right? So like he can tell you about America, 
Um, I think it's a different thing. I don't, I don't see him doing this, looking at us from up under here. Um, but that's, you know, we got other writers who do that. Um, I'm reading Toni Morrison, uh, her new book, where I think it came out like, I don't know, a month ago. I shouldn't have to tell y'all to read Toni Morrison, but it's, you should be reading this. Uh, I, I was reading her book and going, I'll never be able to do this. Like, I just cannot imagine being this wise. Uh, I read, uh, read an article on brain pickings. Anyone ever read that website? Go to brain. And it was on uh, wisdom, the age of wisdom. Did you see this, that one? And she was uh, talking about the difference between information, knowledge, and wisdom. She said, we know what information is, right? So it's a fact about the world that we believe is true. And then she said, knowledge is when you take, uh, it's when you using, uh, what is it, how does she say it? Knowledge is when you uh, can draw some conclusions about the, about the facts to like solve some kind of problem. And then she said uh, that wisdom required a moral component because wisdom was saying I'm taking this knowledge and I'm using it for something that I think is going to like be beneficial in the world. I'm not, this is not exact paraphrasing, but I like that idea that like, like wisdom had this kind of moral component that knowledge didn't necessarily have, right? That if you were wise, you would be doing things that were benefiting the world. And I think not only does Toni Morrison have the information and the knowledge, she's like, is there anyone more wise than her? Right? Like, to me, what I see is like, like wisdom in Toni Morrison, which has to come out of those, those other things. Let me see him pick one more person. Mm. Uh... Uh, I should pick a novelist. Let me pick a novelist. Mm, Edward P. Jones. Uh, he don't have any new books. Uh, he has the uh, Lost in the City, which is like 1993 or 96, one of those. Then he has The Known World, which was about slave owner, black slave owners in Virginia, uh, which won like maybe the 2004 Pulitzer. Then he has a short story collection called All of Hager's Children. And he is also someone who uh, strikes me as a wise writer. Um, and I really, what I appreciate about him is he sticks to home. Uh, he writes about the DMV. So, you know, Virginia, uh, DC. Um, so I really, uh, I think that he, though he, that's all, if you read those three books, like you've read all of his output, but I, I think that he's one of the greatest living writers in just those three books. Um, yeah, so those are my three. But yeah, I understand what you're saying. Like you, they, they, they wanted, like they only let a few people in the door, right? Like I, I hang out with my writer friends, and they're like, "Oh, Mitch, you know they let you in the door," and I, I recognize that. Sometimes I ask myself, "Why did they let me in?" You know, what is it that you see? Um, but, but then I also know once you get in there, it's like, are you just going to do what they want you to do or they think you should do? Or are you going to kind of have a fidelity to your moral compass? And uh, I can tell you that I have been doing a lot of fighting over the last couple of weeks with the way, even with headlines. I have changed at least four headlines in the last few weeks, and I won't even tell you what publications these were, but you would be probably surprised if I told you who needed some revision on their headlines. Uh, anyone else, anyone else? I am a second grade teacher. Oh. Um, how would you talk to second graders about writing? Ooh, ooh, ooh. How would I talk to second graders about writing? Man, it's hard for me to th remember the writing task of second grade. Like, are they, they haven't got into, like, essays yet or anything, you know? No, personal, personal narratives. Personal narratives, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I probably wouldn't, well, 
I would first, first I would try to turn them into readers. Uh, so the I just saw that Pamela Paul, who is the New York New York Times book review main editor, executive, I don't know what her exact title, but she runs the New York Times book review, but she has a book coming out called How to Create Young Readers. Um, I have not read the book, but I'm really interested in that because I think, I don't know a like person that I think is brilliant, very knowledgeable and wise who isn't a reader. Um, so I think if you create a reader, you're already creating a writer. Um, and then I probably would, since it's, you're talking about narrative, like I would ask him to journal. You know, like I never considered myself a writer until I was in my maybe late 20s or, mm, that's not true, in my 20s. But my mom pulls out journals that I wrote when I was 10, 11 years old in these like spiral notebooks. And so I, I, I must have thought that, that there was some, something uh, that was necessary for me to do. So I, yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm sure if you're a second grader, you've like already studied all of this kind of primary education stuff. But like, yeah, man, make us some readers, and I think the rest kind of works itself out, right? I don't see any more hands. Uh, I really want to thank you all for sitting with me. Uh, this is a memorable. I'm, I know I do a lot of digressions. You know, that's my thing. I love a digression. Uh, but yeah, I, I had a great time. Uh, the last time I was in San Francisco, I'll end with this story. I was on, uh, I forgot the name of the bookstore, but it's on like the wharf. It's like in this, like, just no one knows this bookstore. Book Passage, maybe, maybe. In the ferry building? Yes, in the ferry building. So I don't remember where my hotel was, but whatever. Uh, I asked the, the, the uh, concierge, like, how long does it take to get to the book place? And they're like, oh, man, it only takes, you know, 15 minutes. So uh, I think this is like pre-Uber, too. Yeah, this is, this is like 2013. And uh, I walk outside, and it's like so much traffic, right? So I get in a car, and we're not moving. We are not moving. We driving a little bit, and I'm looking at my watch, and I and I kind of waited too, cause they told me like 15 minutes, so I'm like, all right, cool. So the hand is ticking. I'm in the car. It's not moving. We go a little further. He's like, oh yeah, man. Oh, I don't know, man. So then I'm like, I said, well, where is this place? And he said, it's down there. <laughs> he was like, go down that way. So I jump out the car, out the cab, and I start running. I got my book bag on. It's like not a warm day, because y'all don't really get warm days, but it's like warm enough. Running, 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 running. It, it, when he said down there, it looked a lot shorter <laughs> than, than what it actually was. So I'm huffing, huffing, and I get there like 35 minutes late. When I get there, sweat is pouring all down my face. I walk in there, and the lady was like, we just canceled it. Like, we didn't think you were going to show up. I said, oh, my God. <laughs> so that was my last reading in San Francisco. <laughs> I thank y'all for actually being here, for them to get me a driver. So I made it here on time. 